Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in today. Today we're going to talk about a few things. We're going to talk about to find the derivative of a function and derivative notation. We're going to try to estimate derivatives of a function at a point, and we're going to try to connect differentiability and continuity together as well. So let's uh, recall from last video here, we have this equation, f prime of c equals limit as x approaches c of f of x minus f of c over x minus c. This limit, which calculates the derivative of the function when x equals c, can also be expressed a little differently. What if we wanted the general derivative that can be computed for any value of x and not just at one value c? Okay. All right, so consider the limit f of x minus f of c over x minus c, the limit as x approaches c. But instead, let's have x equals c plus h, and let's rewrite our limit out here. So we have limit as c plus h approaches c of f of c plus h minus f of c over c plus h minus c. Okay, and we can simplify that. If we want c plus h just to go to c, well, that means we just want h to be zero, or at least go towards zero as quickly, as close as we can. The numerator, there's nothing we could simplify there. And the denominator, c minus c cancels out, and we're left with just h. And that right there is called the alternate form of the derivative. So you see in this box here, another way to think of the derivative of the function when x is equal to c is f prime of c equals the limit as h approaches zero of f of c plus h minus f of c over h. All right, what's powerful about that definition of derivative is that if we don't just want some value c, but instead we want the entire function, the entire derivative everywhere, we can do that just by replacing c with x. So this right here is the derivative of f everywhere. Okay, in this green box over here, um, all we're doing here is replacing variables with different variables, okay? It's, it hasn't changed much. It's still the same variables. Um, still, I'm sorry, still the same meaning, just has different variables in it, that's all. So instead of using h, we're using delta x. And delta x, you may know from your science classes, delta means change in, so that's just the change in x. Okay, one last thing before we take a look at problems. The word derivative is actually a noun. Often directions may ask you to find the derivative of a function as differentiate the function. Differentiate is a verb. So if you differentiate a function, you find the derivative. As we can see here in example one, the question says to differentiate f of x equals root x and determine the domain of f prime of x. All right, so we're going to use our newly found limit definition. So f prime of x was limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. And we want to be able to put 0 in for h, but if we do that right now, we'll get 0 over 0, which means we know there is a limit, but we have to do some work so what work do we do? We're going to conjugate the numerator by multiplying by 1. But 1 in this case would be root x plus h plus root x. And if we then simplify that, we would get limit as h approaches 0. Root x plus h times root x plus h is just x plus h. This is the difference of squares, so the middle two terms will cancel. And then negative root x times positive root x is just minus x. Over the whole denominator, which is h, times
times everything we multiplied by, which is root x plus h plus root x. All right, now we can see x minus x cancels out. So we're left with limit as h approaches 0 of just h over my denominator. And now we can see h over h cancels out. So finally, we're left with just a 1 in the numerator and that, that expression in our denominator. And now if we put 0 in for h, we would get 1 over root x plus root x or 1 over 2 root x. Okay, and the domain of the derivative as well. So first of all, here's our derivative. I wrote 2 there and I meant to say 1. It should be 1 over 2 root x. And the domain of that, well, x can't be 0 because then we'd have a 0 in our denominator. It also can't be negative because we can't take the square root of a negative number. So the domain of our derivative here would just be 0 to infinity. Our example two says to identify the parts of the definition of the derivative. We are asked to find what the function f is and what our c value would be here. All right, so in this case, the function is going to be root x. You can see from here. Now that's root x plus h, but we just want to look at root x. And our c value. Well, that's clearly 9. And if we take the square root of 9, we would get 3. And that's why we have f of c over there, square root of 9, which is 3. All right, part b, this is our f of x here, right? Our f of x would be 2 plus x cubed. And our c value for this one would be negative 3. If you're not sure how... We got that here. You can set our second part of this, negative 25, equal to our function. And that's how you get your c value to be negative 3. And then c here, this is a, actually it looks very complicated, but it's probably the easiest one because our function this is our function right here, and you might see it. It's the same thing. It's x cubed minus 5x squared plus 4x minus 7. So our function is x cubed minus 5x squared plus 4x minus 7, and our c value here is just x. There's no numbers being substituted in there, just x. All right, example three, we're going to talk about a graph with a sharp turn here. So it says the derivative of a graph with a sharp turn. Sketch the graph and find the derivative of f of x equals absolute value of x minus 2 when x equals 2. So we know the absolute value of the graph looks like a v, right? The minus 2 will simply shift that over to the right 2. So our graph will look something like this. We want to know what is the derivative right there, okay? Remember, a derivative is just a slope. So what's the slope right there? Well, that's a pretty tough question to answer. We don't know what the slope is right there. But maybe we can do a left-hand slope and a right-hand slope and see if they match, okay? So from the left-hand side, It's just a line that's going down. So we have notation for this, but we haven't really talked about it yet. But we'll just write it out right now. The left-handed derivative, left-handed derivative would be negative 1. The slope of this line is negative 1. The right-handed derivative, again, that's just a line, so that's nice. 
But unfortunately, the slope is not negative one. The right-handed derivative, the slope would be one. And since those two slopes are the same, we say that the slope at two doesn't exist, or in calculus terms, f prime of two does not exist. And another word that we'll talk about later on today, we say the function is not differentiable at x equals two. Next we'll talk about vertical tangent lines. Okay, if we can see here, the definition of a tangent line to a curve does not cover the possibility of a vertical tangent line. For vertical tangent lines, it's possible to use this definition. If f is continuous at c, and if this limit equals infinity or negative infinity, then the vertical line passing through c, f of c, is a vertical tangent line to the graph of f. Okay? So here we have a continuous function at c. And that would be what a vertical tangent line looks like. So let's take a look at one. Sketch a graph and find the derivative of f of x equals x to the one-third when x equals zero. All right, if you don't know what x to the one-third graph looks like, you can start plugging points in. If you put zero in, you get zero back. If you put one in, you get one back. If you put negative one in, you get negative one back. The next point that would give us a nice answer is eight. Eight to the one-third would be two, but that's all the way over here somewhere. So really, this graph is going to look something like that. Okay, and then it says to find the derivative at x equals zero. All right, well, if you, we use our limit definition we were talking about earlier today, limit as x approaches zero of f of x minus f of zero. Well, we know what f of zero is. f of zero is just zero, right? Over x minus zero. And if we put zero in right now, we'll get zero over zero, but that doesn't really help us here. So let's do some simplifying. We have limit as x approaches zero of x to the one-third over x which is the same thing as saying limit as x approaches zero of x to the one-third over x to the three-thirds, which is x to the negative two-thirds, or one over x to the two-thirds. And now if we put zero in, we get one over zero, which does not exist, right? We get one over zero, which is infinity. So we're going to have a vertical tangent line here. So we would say the derivative at zero does not exist because it's a vertical tangent line to the graph. The slope is undefined. If you want to connect that to geometry, the slope of that graph there would be undefined. All right, so let's sum up some rules here for differentiability. A function is not differentiable at a point where the graph has any of these four things. We already talked about two of them. We talked about a corner and a vertical tangent. A cusp is pretty much the same thing as a corner, except it's rounded as it enters the cusp instead of straight as it enters a corner. And lastly, a discontinuity, which makes sense. If there's no point on the graph there, <clears throat> or if there's a jump in the graph there, then the derivative is not going to exist. There's not going to be a slope on the graph as well. So let's just go through these and talk about continuous versus differential, and that'll lead us into um, some other things we're going to talk about later today. So this function is clearly continuous everywhere. There's no holes, there's no jumps, there's no asymptotes in the graph. But as we discussed earlier, it is not differentiable at that corner there. So we would say it's differentiable everywhere but zero. Okay, and a cusp, same thing. This function looks to be continuous everywhere. But there would not be a derivative here. There's not going to be a slope there. So this one would also not be differentiable at zero. And just so you know, it's not always zero. It just happens to be that these graphs have the corner or the cusp at zero. If you go back to this problem we did earlier today, we would say it's differentiable on negative infinity to two and two to infinity. Vertical tangent line, we talked about this one. Okay, so it's continuous everywhere again. But again, this one's not differentiable at zero. So we'd say negative infinity to zero and zero to infinity. And again, that could be anywhere. It doesn't have to be zero. But in this case, there's a vertical tangent at zero. 
And lastly, we haven't talked about this one yet, but it should be pretty obvious. If it's not continuous, it's not differentiable. So this one is not continuous. Let's say, I'm sorry, it is continuous. Negative infinity to zero, and there's an asymptote. Zero to two, and there's a hole. Two to four, and there's a jump. Four to six, and there's a, another hole, a removable discontinuity. And it looks like six to infinity. So all the points where it's not continuous, it's also not differentiable. So our differentiable intervals would be the same. All right, so summing up here, derivatives fail to exist when? The derivative of a function fails to exist at a point where the function is a sharp turn or a cusp. Number two, the derivative of a function fails to exist at a point where the function has a vertical tangent. And the third one, it fails to exist at a point where the function is not continuous. That's some bad English there. It is not continuous. The theorem below will become very important throughout this course by allowing you to apply other theorems along the way. This is a very important theorem we will use a lot throughout the year. If a function is differentiable at a point, it is automatically continuous at that point. Okay, so if I say it's differentiable at x equals 2, you automatically know it's continuous at x equals 2. If I say a function is differentiable everywhere, you know it is continuous everywhere. Okay, true or false, the converse is true. So, if a function is continuous, does it have to be differentiable? Well, we already know that it's not. We talked about this earlier today. If we have a function that looks like this, since it's not continuous at this value right here, it would not be differentiable at that value there. Okay, or if we drew another picture, uh, maybe a vertical asymptote there. So then at C, it would not be differentiable or continuous. Okay? But that's not what the question is truly asking us to do. We want to know if it is continuous. Would it also be differentiable? Okay? And we did already see two examples of this earlier where we know this is not true. And that would be the corner and the cusp. So let's say we have a corner at x equals c. So the graph looks like this. We know the function is continuous at x equals c, but we learned today it is not differentiable at x equals c. So therefore, this one would be false. Differentiability implies continuity, but not the other way around. All right, number five. This is a problem that almost always shows up in the AP test every year. Estimating the value of a derivative numerically. The table below gives a body temperature T over time little t of a polar bear on a cold Arctic day. Estimate the value of T prime of 5.5. So you might be thinking, well, I don't have T prime. I don't know that. And I don't have T, so I can't take a derivative. T prime of 5.5 is asking for an instantaneous rate of change. There is no way to get the instantaneous rate of change based on what we know. That's why this word is here. How do we estimate an instantaneous rate of change? We take an average rate of change, okay? And how do we find the best average rate of change? We wanna take the closest numbers to 5.5 we can find. In this case, these two points. So we would say T prime of 5.5 is approximately, because this is not exact, this is our best guess. Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. All right, and if we do that, we should get negative 0 0.28, and the units here would be Fahrenheit per minute. What does that mean? That his body temperature is dropping 
a little over a quarter of degree Fahrenheit every minute. That problem will show up again later on this year. All right. One more thing before we do a couple more practice problems here. Perhaps you recall a very important equation from Algebra 1 many years ago that enabled you to write the equation of a line. It was called the point-slope formula and looked like this. So we have a point and you have a slope, hence the name point-slope formula. By simply renaming some of the values within that equation, we come up with a powerful tool to write the equation of a tangent line. So here is your equation of a tangent line. Provided the slope of the tangent line exists, this is point-slope form. What's our point? Our point is c comma f of c, and our slope is the derivative at c. And one more thing that we'll talk a lot more about later on, but just to throw it out there to you now so you start to see it, a normal line, normal just means perpendicular, normal is the calculus word for perpendicular, if you want the normal line of that graph, all you want to do is take the opposite reciprocal slope to the tangent line. So you can see here we take the opposite reciprocal slope to the tangent line, and that would give us our normal line. All right, let's try a couple problems here. If you want to try these on your own, feel free to pause the video and come back when you're ready. If not, we'll go through them together. The graph of the function f given below consists of three line segments. Find f prime of 4. So f prime of 4. This is 4 right here. We're counting by 2s. So we want to know what the derivative is right here. Remember, derivative is just a slope, right? So we want to find the slope of this line. That's how we're going to do this problem. So the slope of this line would be 13 minus 1 over 6 minus 2. 6 minus 0. I don't know why I said 2. I'm sorry. 6 minus 0. 0, 0.0 comma 1 there. And 12 over 2 would be, 12 over 6 would be 2. So our slope of that line would be 2. Example 7, the function f is defined on the closed interval negative 2 to 16. The graph of the derivative of f is given below. So here's a graph of the derivative. It's important for us to know this is the graph of the derivative. Okay. The point 14, negative 2 is on the graph of the function. The equation of the tangent line would be what? All right, so we want to know at x equals 14, what is the slope? The slope would be 3. So we have the slope is 3, and we have the point that was given to us, 14, negative 2. So all we're going to do is put that into point-slope form, and that would again be b. Our example 8, if the line 2x plus 3y equals k is tangent to the graph of y equals f of x at the point where x equals 5, the value of the limit as x approaches 5 of f of x minus f of 5 over x minus 5 is what? All right, let's recall for a second that this right here is the slope of the tangent line when x equals 5, okay? So this is a line in standard form. If we took that line and we rewrote it, in slope-intercept form, this is what we get. So that'd be the slope in, in uh, the, the line in slope-intercept form. Okay. What's the slope of that line? It's negative two thirds. So that means this, which is the slope of the tangent line, is negative two-thirds, which is B again. How about that? That'll do it for our lesson today. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope to see you again soon.